Welcome back to the club, everybody. I am the CLB, and today we're doing something a little bit different. Uh, if you watched my last video, you may know I had a brain surgery, emergency brain surgery, a little over two months ago, closer to three months now, actually. I'm still in the recovery process, and today I just want to go through kind of how that's been, as well as my history of brain tumors. It's been about 16 years of having recurring meningiomas, so I just want to tell you a little bit about what that's been like, what I've learned from it, and maybe some of that can help you if you're going through something tough. So while we do that, let's do something that's a little more fun, a little more calming, because this is going to be a little bit of a tougher subject. So we're going to be playing Power Wash Simulator. I actually saw Markiplier doing this and talking to some friends about stuff, especially with uh, Ethan doing Unis Anis. Uh, talking about their experience with that and so I wanted to do kind of something similar just talking and washing You know, it's very relaxing get the sound in the background Yeah, get the rewarding Nice feeling of cleaning while we talk about something that's a little bit harder So the reason I'm making this today. I've been wanting to make this video for a while But the reason I'm doing it specifically today is because tomorrow I go in for radiation treatments It's gonna be 30 treatments over six weeks, and it's going to be fairly easy, I think. I've had this done one time before, and the only effect I had was some hair loss, which is unfortunately permanent. You can see. Here, I'll show you. You've probably, you've probably seen it in other videos. A little bald spot on my head. My jeans were, well, they still are, but these have kind of changed the plan here that uh, I was supposed to have hair into my 90s, a nice full head of hair. My grandfather on my mom's side, which is where that comes from, he had a full head of hair. He loved it, he was proud of it, and I was excited to have that too. But, you know, things change. Life does not always go the way you expect, and that's kind of one of the big things I've learned through this, and how to just kind of let go of that uh, desire for where things go, and just roll with it. Enjoy whatever is coming to you, because even through all this, despite all the shitty, shitty things that you have to go through for it, I'll tell you a little bit about that soon. But despite all that, there's still plenty of good that comes for it, comes from it. You get, you get to see all the people that really love you and care for you come out to support you and help you in so many different ways. You get an experience that you generally wouldn't get another way. I, I learned a lot of this very young. Well, let's start at the beginning, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to all of those conclusions. Basically, this first started, first tumor showed up, probably around the time I was born. <laughs> uh, the doctor said I had it from a very long time, they couldn't say exactly when, but likely from the time I was born. Just one of those things, mutation and oddity. Uh -huh. So I just have, I found out I have a gene that predisposes me to meningiomas. So that's where it came from. Nobody's fault, just, you know, something that happens. Uh, we all have different things. This was mine. So it had been growing probably from the time I was a kid. Started really feeling symptoms of it uh, around high school. Uh, I started getting sick every morning, more headaches. Uh, I missed a lot of school doing, due to throwing up in the morning and just feeling really crappy. Uh, so, yeah, that wasn't great. It wasn't a great way to finish high school. I'll get up there in a minute. So, that's when I kind of started noticing things, and then the headaches started getting worse into college. And eventually, when I was 21, just after a visit to a monastery, actually, I had been studying all kinds of religion, philosophy, and psychology. Those were my favorite cla favorite classes. I was definitely an undecided major for a long time. Hang on, I gotta see if there's an auto, auto spray on here. One second. Never mind. Okay, we'll just do this. So I, I tended toward those courses that made me wonder how the world worked and question my own thinking, that kind of stuff. And it led me to a lot of knowledge that helped as I was getting toward finding out about this tumor. Just wisdom about letting go, about suffering, a Buddhist concept of suffering being rooted in our desires, like wanting things to happen one way, but the world has other plans. The river takes its own course sometimes. We can't always control where we get taken. 
And so we have to sometimes relinquish the control. And doing that can be very hard for people. I've been practicing it through meditation, through these courses and other things in my life, just kind of being able to let things go because I'd been sick so much with feeling sick in the mornings, all that kind of thing. So I'd, I'd sort of been learning these lessons and then having these classes teaching about religion and mystics and all this kind of stuff, putting words to all these things that I'd been learning and feeling as I'd grown up with this tumor growing. And I actually felt like I was going to die young. I told my mom when I was about eight years old that I felt like I was going to die young. She told me this later. And she said it scared the crap out of her, of course. But for me, that I didn't know that I'd told her that. But that feeling never really went away, which is part of what led me to the classes where I had learned about how to let go and how to deal with death and life. Because one of the things when you start thinking about death is it just leads you back to life. If I'm going to die, how do I live? Which is essentially why I'm making this video. I went to L.A. for a visit to a cancer center to get a second opinion last week. And basically the prognosis for this is keep doing surgeries and radiation treatments, but we just don't know if, you know, one's going to crop up in an area that gives me some sort of disability. With this most recent one, I started to lose some vision. I've had a little bit of numbness recently that's starting to go away, which is nice. But you just never know what's going to happen. So they basically gave me the advice. Whatever you want to do, make sure you're doing it now. So, here I am. What I want to do is share all this stuff with you guys. And sorry I'm kind of going all over the place. It's a little bit of the brain fog from the tumor recovery, from the surgery recovery. And it's a little bit of just all of this is connected in different ways. So as I touch on one thing, I might kind of jump over to something related to it. It's, it's a lot. But let's go back again <laughs> to my first tumor, 2008. I was learning a lot about how to deal with life not going your way. And so when I heard about the tumor, after I visited the monastery, had a terrible headache there. I, was, I thought it was just a migraine, but I found later that it was definitely way more serious. Could have had a seizure, could have had a bleed, or it could have been really bad, essentially. But I was up on a mountain at a monastery with no power and... It was an awful experience in that night that I was suffering through that, but I also learned a whole lot of things there too about Christianity, one, that I never really appreciated until then, and two, just the power of love in the universe. And then after I was diagnosed with the tumor, seeing that in my family and friends, and just sort of feeling that in the course of the universe, how I'd been sort of led to all these ideas that helped me through that tough period. Oh, look at that. See, led to the ideas. So, oh crap. <laughs> Once I heard about that first tumor in 2008, I had just turned 21. I had to ask the doctors to get a brain scan. It ended up being a CT scan. I didn't know what kind, but after that experience with a terrible headache, could have been worse, but I, I had to ask myself. So another thing I want to share is make sure you are your own advocate. Like, not necessarily be a hypochondriac, but if you have repeated signs that something's wrong, go ask for what you need to get checked. Doctors are human. Nurses are human. They, they know a lot, but they're very busy these days. Stay on top of it. They make mistakes, but they're also very good. Uh, it can go both ways, so stay on top of it. I found out about that first tumor in 2008, and the crazy thing is, as soon as I heard about it, I wasn't scared. I no longer had that feeling that I was going to die young. That same feeling that I had that I was going to die was just straight knowledge that I wouldn't. I was not worried. It was more, oh wow, that, that other feeling was just preparing me for this moment. I know how to deal with this. I'm not afraid. So it ended up mostly being me consoling the people around me that, hey, don't, don't worry. It's, it's going to be fine. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid. It was strange. I had sort of learned by listening to that feeling that I was going to die that I had before. I'd learned to listen to that same voice and it was saying with all the knowledge that it had now of 
the people I was going to call. <laughs> one of my best friends through middle school and high school. His dad is one of the best surgeons in the country, the head of neurosurgery at Duke University. And he was one of the first people I called, of course. And just knowing that he would be in my corner, if he wasn't going to be working on me, he would know who to talk to. So I felt like everything just kind of lined up. And the universe was conspiring in my favor, to use the words in one of my favorite books, The Alchemist. If you, if you realize your path and you keep following it, the universe is going to work to get you there. All right. So that first surgery in 2008, it went really well. Uh, like I said, I had an amazing surgeon. I had great people to support me. And I knew I would be fine. Turns out I was. <laughs> they did a great job. Uh, the only thing I had was uh, a bunch of plates. Uh, I'll put some images here of the surgery, how big the tumor was. Since it had been growing for such a long time, it was absolutely massive. I was around the size of my fist, all told. You'll see an image. It goes from the top of the head, down the back, and then it winged out in the sides of my neck. Sorry, it winged out in the sides of my neck. It meant that they had to go through some muscles, they had to put plates and screws and a bone graft where the tumor was actually eating through my skull at the very top, the crown of my head. So there was a lot going on. It was actually amazing that they were able to do what they did. But I knew it. I knew I was going to be fine. Uh, what I came out with was just some chronic pain, which is rough. Uh, I was going to record this video yesterday, but I was in so much pain I just absolutely couldn't. Which happens sometimes. That's, that's just something I have to live with after this. So instead... Instead of losing any of me, of my personality, my cognitive ability, uh, my vision, uh, the tumor was located near my occipital lobe, which you, if you know about biology and anatomy, you know that that is what controls vision. So the occipital controls vision, and it was right along my occipital lobe. I'd been losing some of my visual field right before surgery, my left visual field, because the tumor was on the right, and the brain controls on opposite sides. Fun fact. So I lost some vision before, but it came back right after, which is fantastic. Um, recovery was long, I'll be honest. I tried to go back to school to a summer class, because this was in college. I had to leave my semester leave my friends like a week into the semester starting. Another fun fact, the surgery was on leap year day. So I celebrate leap year day a little bit different. Actually, I'm probably the only one who celebrates leap year day. But uh, it's every four years I get to say this is the anniversary of the first surgery. And it's also strange that the tumors come back around every four years. Around. It's not exact. But yeah, the recovery from that first one was pretty long. I tried to go back to a summer school in Boston, and I just, I felt dumb. I couldn't understand things as easily as I used to. I couldn't hold concepts in my head. I didn't have, like, the ability to process things the way that I was used to, and that was really tough to get used to. Really tough. Uh... Along with that, I was on anti-seizure medications that were really messing with my mood, and it was just a, a rough time. I had to really just take... Oh, all right, that cleaned itself up. Love that. I had to take time to off of school to recover and actually heal. Where are we going to start next? That's the thing. With these big things like this video or with cleaning this whole big park, where do you start? Well, you start wherever you want. Start at the beginning. And you just go. And you just have to do it. Which is... <laughs> I struggled to start making this video because there's so much to it, as you can hear. I'm going back and forth around to so many different things. I hope uh, I hope some of it makes sense. I'll have a, a more comprehensive video soon. I'm making another channel where I'm actually just going to read the books that I've written on this. I've written two books after that first surgery. I took time off. I went back to school, I tried to figure out what I wanted to do with myself, and ended up majoring in philosophy, because it was the thing that helped me most after the surgery. It wasn't psychology where I'd planned to go, in the 
course of study I planned to go into before was psychology with just a minor in philosophy or just taking the classes to for myself because it was so interesting and helpful to me you know I was trying to process life and death before I heard about the tumor and then afterwards it was like well yeah now I really want to know more about this which is when I just dove into books all about it and this was after I took a semester off to recover doctors said it could take time for normal brain function to come back they called it brain fog I'm still having that now which is another reason why this is a bit disjointed but that's okay because uh, regardless I just needed to make this just to get it all out there for you for me for everybody who knows me wants to know more about it for anybody going through a brain surgery or any kind of surgery and just dealing with some of the issues that it brings up hopefully it can help even in this disjointed format. Hopefully the water helps. <laughs> the soothing, cleaning can take away from my disjointed ramblings. But I went back to school <laughs> and graduated in 2010 with my major in philosophy, mostly in the study of life and death and virtues and essentially how death is a natural pointer for us to start inquiring as philosophers and to learn what it is to be alive and what makes a human happy what we can do what our purpose is in this world what the meaning of life is we'll get to that maybe today maybe another day maybe i'll just tease it in this one <laughs> no that's not what i'm here to do i'm not here to just get subscribers i'm here to help you guys out so i finished up school and then didn't know what to do, to my, do with myself. Uh, did I go back to school for like going into law or something like that? Philosophy is a good major to go into other majors, essentially. So I was trying to figure out what to do, took some time off, and ended up living with a friend down in Florida where I'd gone to school, just a little bit south of where I went to school, in Sarasota, Florida, and writing a book for a year. This was partially for therapy for me to get it out there and also because one of the things that I found through that first surgery was that one of the points of suffering going through something like that was that it's an incredible opportunity to learn and grow that's kind of the point of suffering in life hardships the world is kind of built around this idea for life to be exposed to hardships, learn from it, and grow. And the way humans do that is that we share those things. We don't have to personally go through it to learn. We can share what we've been through. I can go through this tumor experience, tell somebody about it, the things that helped me, and then when they have a cancer experience, be it themselves, somebody they know, or they have another experience that brings out the same kind of worries and troubles that they don't have to go through it to learn it. They can learn from someone else who's already been through it. They can preempt that pain, make it a little bit easier for the next person. The next generation of life becomes a little bit stronger, a little bit more resilient. We know how to deal with one more thing. So when you go through something like this, it makes you want to say, hey guys, here's what I learned. I hope it helps you get through it. There's a concept in, I believe it's Hinduism, sorry, my brain's not super working right now, so if I get a reference wrong, let me know. But the concept is Dharma. It is duty. And that's what I felt. It was this duty as a human being, this sort of innate thing that we're born with is to share the things we've been through, to move the species forward. You know, it's, it sounds like a pretty noble thing, but it's also just the most basic thing. It's how humans work. And so with each generation, we go through different pains, growing pains as we 
get into new technologies, whatever. We learn what they do wrong and we learn how to fix it. But we can only do that if we don't deny things, don't shove them to the side, confront them. We have to confront them and say, okay, what can we learn from this? So that's part of what this is, is confronting what has happened and how we can deal with it. And it's helping me too to remember how I've dealt with this in the past as I go into the next round of treatment. So I wrote this book in 2012, around 2012, and never ended up publishing it, partially because of my own uh, anxieties around it and sharing myself, which is why I've been using this YouTube channel to get over, to be more comfortable with putting myself out there, and especially in a video like this, which is why I've been nervous to film, is very personal, and to put yourself on there, out there on that level it's difficult for some people. Some people it seems easy, but honestly, maybe they just have a good strategy to overcome it. I don't know yet. So, share. <laughs> share, other YouTubers. Let me know how you do it. Uh, so I, I wrote that book, and I, what I'm going to end up doing is, on another channel, reading that book, and also another one that I wrote. We'll get to that. Because I want to share it, and I don't want to go through the whole editing process and paying for an editor it's super expensive so I'm editing it myself uh, going through it and you know it won't be perfect but I think that's okay that's kind of the point I'll share that channel when it's when it's ready I have to go through and make some fixes to everything but that'll be there so I had that book and just as I was finishing it up uh, I went for another scan I started having yearly scans after that first one in 2008 They'd all been clear, so we moved from every six months to a year, and then at the end of 2012, one of those scans was no longer clear. We were seeing regrowth from the first tumor. And that meant going in for another surgery in 2013. I believe it was in February again, I can't really remember right now, because my brain doesn't do much remembering well right now. So. I was back in for another surgery, and this one felt easier because I'd done it before. Uh, it was also a much smaller one. Uh, the tumor was smaller, they caught it earlier. It was also, a, to mention, this: the first one was a grade 1 out of 3, which meant it was the least problematic, slowest growing, uh, least invasive, and it was also benign, which meant it was not infecting other things, it was non-cancerous. but. That still didn't mean it was any less dangerous or has come back any less. Well, maybe a little bit less from a cancer. But it's still a, a big issue. It, it definitely feels like a cancer. It's a rogue cell growing in your brain, as one of the doctors put it. It may not be cancer, but it might as well be. It's kind of just a, a taxonomical classification, but in practice, there's not much difference for me. <laughs> So that second one was a regrowth of the first tumor, a grade one meningioma, because we hadn't done radiation on that first one. It was so widespread that the best approach was to just wait and watch. And hopefully it would just, they got so much of it that it just wouldn't regrow. That was the hope. But you know, things don't always go that way. We already got lucky with it being benign, them doing a great surgery, me coming out with barely any deficits minus the chronic pain, so it was great. Uh, regrowth just meant another surgery at this point. So we went in for surgery, I say we because my family felt like as much a part of it as me. So if you hear me say we, that's what I mean. I'm not using a royal we or a psychotic we. <laughs> it's just a uh, a reference to the team because it always felt like a team effort so if you ever have to go through something like this find yourself the people who will be on your team because man it helps both for catching things in the hospitals wrong medications prescribed asking questions that you might not be thinking about because you're processing all the things you're gonna have to go through it's good to have somebody who can think about okay what does this mean long term what do we have to prepare for afterwards 
Do we need to get a special bed? What about pillows? What kind of sleeping will be painful? What will be okay? All those questions and more. But make sure you've got people. Get people on your side. I was wondering why this isn't clean yet. There's always the little bits to get clean still. Unless I'm missing something major. Anyway, had that second surgery. It also went very well. Also done by Dr. Friedman. He's the best. And it was great. No additional pain, no additional issues afterward. So it was, again, went about as well as we could hope. But this time, we decided to do a radiation along with it. Because at this point, it was a smaller area. We could focus on exactly where to hit to get the areas around it to basically stop any cells that were left over from being able to regrow. That was the main goal. So that was just like I'm about to have tomorrow, 30 courses of radiation over six weeks. And the only problem was the hair loss and that I can get used to, you know. Most people will be going bald in the same way that I am and I actually will probably end up uh, buzzing my hair here if you see in the next video I might not have this much hair I'll just, just take it all the way down but not you know shave down to the skin kind of thing we'll see uh, it's gonna be the effects during the radiation it feels like a sunburn on your scalp I actually shaved my head I went to a professional barber to have my head shaved and like the whole nine yards and man was that painful I did not realize how bad it would be because my skin was so sensitive when they put on especially the aftershave whoo, I didn't know that I could feel pain like that I nearly cried in the barber shop <laughs> it was so bad so note to anyone going through radiation in a specific spot it's gonna make you tender don't have razors and that kind of thing on your scalp bad idea Learn from my mistakes. This is what I'm here for. <laughs> so just that loss of hair. You know, I was working during the time in a customer service position. They let me have a hat on or some kind of, you know, covering on my head so I didn't feel as weird about not having hair or my hair being in a weird uh, pattern because it, it didn't get lost in one place. The radiation was aimed in multiple directions you know, coming in from multiple angles, so it was not a spot of hair loss. It was patchy and kind of snaked around, you know, so they could get all the right spots. It's what they got to do, so I just dealt with the consequences. It wasn't so bad. You know, it mostly came back. Eh, not really. I mean, I showed you the spot. But that's it is what it is. So we had that... Um, Oh, actually, I, I missed something in between that surgery and the radiation. So that second surgery in 2012, I had that, and I was on anti-seizure medications afterward. And then they took me off the anti-seizure medications after a couple months, which they had done after the first one as well. But I don't know if they did it too soon or if it was just bad luck. Either way, I had a gigantic seizure one morning. It was actually before I even woke up. Or maybe I did wake up and I just forgot it in the aftermath of the seizure because I could not remember much for the two days after that. Like, I still am very patchy. All I really remember is seeing paramedics standing over me when I woke up. My mom said I had an eight-minute seizure. She timed it. I believe she did, but she was also probably freaking out. So it was a long one, that's for sure. Uh, I was mostly okay. I didn't have any deficits from it. I had to go on seizure medication. I couldn't drive for the rest of that year, which was, well, that was not fun. <laughs> I was I was too old to having to be driven around everywhere by my parents. It felt weird. It was very limiting. And my parents had some other issues around the time, too, because of that seizure and, you know, seeing that we're not out of the woods on the tumor thing. And one of those things that I, I dealt with pretty well on that round again. It's just like... I'd already learned that life happens. I'd been writing my book about sharing those lessons that I was telling you about. 
letting go and accepting the things that are happening to you, how I was able to be calm through that first surgery in the face of that gigantic tumor. And honestly, in the face of potential death. There's a lot of the things that I'll, I'll read to you in the book about that experience, about how I dealt with some of the most difficult moments of that, like right before surgery, uh, when I hit a 10 on the pain scale when they embolized the tumor, which means they cut off the blood flow to it, and, you know, when you cut off the food supply of a monster, it's going to thrash around a little bit, sometimes a lot of it, and when there's nowhere for it to go inside your head, that is not a good feeling, I'll tell you what. That's one of those times when you just don't even want to be an inhabitant of the world. The only pain relief is getting away, feeling like you're not in the world. Which is not a good way to be. So that second one, you know, I didn't have any of those embolization pains. I didn't have that crazy stuff. It was pretty easy in terms of the surgery itself. It was really the after effects that were difficult. So that year was tough. That was one of the hardest years of my life for sure, with all this stuff going wrong, along with family and myself, and just trying to figure out what to do with myself from there, because I had written the book, but I don't know, if, I didn't know if I wanted to be a writer or how I would, you know, live off of that or what I wanted to do with myself. Do I go back to school? I thought about going into social work, uh, to law. I have a pretty song, strong sense of justice and logic. And it always been one of my fortes. Um, I honestly thought about doing YouTube at the time, too. I was still playing World of Warcraft like crazy. That was one of my big games growing up. Hardcore Raider. It really felt like a, a sense of growth and accomplishment and teamwork. It was like a team sport without playing a sport. Super, super fun. I loved, loved that period. Made some really good friends through that. And actually, one of them got me into what ended up being the next phase of my life. After that second surgery and recovering from the seizure, I had to figure out what I was doing with myself. And I was working at a massage envy at the front desk, basically doing sales and customer service. That's when I had the radiation treatments and I was having to, you know, sell people massage uh, packages while my hair was falling out. <laughs> it was very weird. Anyway, I was ended up moving up to assistant manager. I do pretty well at most jobs. I go with the philosophy, whatever you do, do it well, and it makes things more exciting to getting through the workday when you're not just hating everything. Just find what you can make fun about it and get through it a lot better. And so ended up getting to assistant manager, and then at one point, the owner asked me if I wanted to manage my own location. And I was like, oh, cool. They, they noticed that I'm doing a good job. That's awesome. And then I was like, I definitely don't want to go down that route. <laughs> that's, that's not what I want to do with my life. No offense to them, but that's just, that wasn't my path. I knew it immediately. Why is this not clean? I don't see anything. Okay, there we go. So at that point, uh, that was when one of my World of Warcraft friends, shout out to Lunchbox, Justin, he, uh, suggested I check out uh, programming, coding, software development, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. So I tried that. Uh, people had also encouraged me to look at it before, but it was sort of, I was in that perfect moment between things where I was like, I definitely don't want that path, but let's really look now at what I want to do. And so I started taking some college courses. I was probably, what, like 25? Wait, this was 2015. So I would have been like 28 at this point. And this was trying to just figure out what to do with myself. Is this something I enjoy? I had taken some courses myself. I think Stanford had an online course that you could take. And I found I really enjoyed it. It was logic, which I was already kind of big in from philosophy and just my own life, how I approach things. Oh, I got to get all those too. Oh no, I gotta get this. There's always something else. So I ended up uh, really enjoying programming. Took some college courses and I was like, okay, how do I get into this? And then my friend 
told me about the boot camps that he'd seen, and I ended up doing one of those boot camps, three months of like 12, 12 hours a day for, yeah, five days a week. Now it's probably honestly six days a week. Got maybe a day to do something else. But it was one of the most intense things I've ever done. I would recommend it to anybody who's interested in just jumping into a new career. It was very good for me. Got me into a career, into a job, and I've just been growing there ever since. I've enjoyed it for the most part. You gotta make sure you find good employers who take care of you, who treat you right, just like any job. Make sure they treat you like a human. <laughs> and the only problem with it so far has been that I haven't been able to do the part of the things that I wanted to do when I set out, which was something that makes me happy. I enjoy the job, I enjoy the logic puzzles, that makes me happy. But I want to be able to help people too. I had that moment of dharma that, that's still with me. To use what I've learned through this uh, tumors and the suffering to help others. And I wasn't feeling like I was getting that, which is why I started YouTube and learning how to put myself out and edit and record. Just kind of do it all right before I bring up the things that I really want to talk about. So, we're here. I know how to do it well enough. And I need to start talking about it now. So that's what we're doing. And in between, let's see, that was around 2015, 2016, I believe, actually, that I got into coding. You know, late 20s. Moved into a completely new career, but I enjoyed it so much. Uh, ended up moving from North Carolina to Portland to try and do better with the chronic pain. Uh, it's mostly activated by weather I've found, so getting out of a place that has freak thunderstorms and can go from 80 to 40 in a day has really helped the pain. It's not perfect here. I'm thinking about moving again soon to an even more stable location and just, you know, seeing where I can live my best life with the least amount of pain. So while I've been trying to do that in 2020, literally a month before COVID got to its really bad state, I found, they found another regrowth. And this one was small enough that they thought that surgery wasn't the best option. And we should just go with uh, radiation. Just a focused radiation, one round, not the 30 broken up sessions that I'd done before, but just hit it with what's called a gamma knife. Which I was like, oh, cool, maybe I'll turn into Hulk. No, not like that. It's not like that at all. <laughs> uh, how that one goes. This was, you know, one of the least painful procedures that I've had, but not pain-free. I'll throw some images up of this one, too, of me in the cage. <laughs> Literally. Uh, except the cage is fixed to your skull and your neck by some giant pins. Just stabbed right into you. Of course, you're, you've got some anesthetic. you got pain medication, so you don't feel it. Until the pain medication wears off with 30 minutes to go in the procedure. And the pain medication won't kick in until it's over. So you might as well just sit through feeling four giant pins stabbed into three locations that are very painful, and one where there's a bunch of scar tissue where they had to go through the neck muscle on the previous surgeries. That final spot is the trigger of a lot of my pain and made that experience absolutely awful. Oh, I must have to get up there. All right, let's get up there. So that was, that was a pretty bad part of that, but compared to recovery from surgery and sort of the long-term pains of that, it was much better, a lot easier. So, you know, I wouldn't wish on anybody, but if you got to choose, go with that one. I mean, depends what your doctor says, really. But, you know. Okay. So, that procedure went well. It was painful, but it stopped the growth of that tumor, which was fantastic, obviously. And that was 2020, right before COVID. So, of course, I was very safe during COVID with, you know, the potential for 
me being lowered immune system a bit with the radiation and going to the hospital a lot. I didn't want to bring anything into people who are even worse than me, of course. So I was super careful that whole time. And we made it through COVID without getting it. It's fantastic. Uh, I was very afraid of the pain, that my chronic pain plus COVID. I didn't think that would be very great. Oh, we can get up there. I'm going to have to go again. Whoa. <laughs> So that was 2020. That went that went well. That went about as well as it could go. Um, and then things were looking good. We got the yearly scans still. Everything was kind of going as expected. And then 2024, four years later, if you'll notice, 2008, 2012, and then radiation the year after in 2014. Then it waited a little while. It waited about six years for the next regrowth, which was great. It seems like radiation kind of slowed things down there. Maybe. Maybe it just was a freak accident. Maybe they just decided to go at that time. I don't know how it works. They don't know either. It's just sometimes the cells decide to do what the cells decide to do. And you have no say in it. And you gotta just, you gotta just deal with that. That's how it is. So after four years of being clear from 2020 to now, in July, I started having some weird vision loss problems. The first one I actually experienced right here at this table. I was reaching for something. I think it was a glass of water. Luckily, I didn't actually hit it. But I reached for it. And then my hand wasn't where I thought it was. And then it just reappeared and almost knocked over the water. It just like hit it when I wasn't expecting it to. Because I could no longer see it. So my sense of where my body was in the world was thrown off. So it wasn't like I completely lost vision, like I didn't see a cone of black. It was just in this about 6 by 12 area, this little box. It was like a little black hole, like all of the images in, in my vision went into it and then came out. It just disappeared, reappeared. There was no cutoff in my vision. It was just anything that went there disappeared and then it was back when it was out of that little box of missing vision. It was very strange. So when that happened, I of course called my neurologist here and said, uh, what do I, should I do something about this? And they said, yes, immediately go to the ER and get some tests, get some scans because vision loss is a high priority indicator of something is probably going wrong. <laughs> and you need to do something fast because it could lead to permanent vision loss. And because of that, I was in the ER for like eight to 10 hours, uh, ended up being admitted. This was right around the time of, there was a crowd strike outage, if you guys remember that. I don't know how recent you're watching this video, if you even remember that two months ago. But it basically took down all the systems and they were still recovering from it. So there were a lot of difficulties getting me in, but I was admitted to the hospital that night and then was in surgery the next morning. My parents flew out and missed me by about 30 minutes before I went into surgery. There's always this moment right before going into a brain surgery where I have to acknowledge that before going into anesthesia, I may not wake up from that anesthesia. I always acknowledge that. I make a conscious decision to note that. Because regardless of how good the surgeon is, you know, how easy it, it should be, things can go wrong. I got a brain tumor that's usually found in older women when I was 21 years old. Things can happen. <laughs> life, life is unpredictable. So every time right before I go under, I make sure to note that it might be my last moment and really, truly, truly appreciate that last moment. And to just acknowledge that, you know, life has been good despite pain, despite, you know, multiple recurring brain tumors. I've had some great experiences, some wonderful travel, wonderful friends, just the best. I've, I've had a good life, I tell you what. Like, regardless of how long it lasts, it's been good. It's been fun. 
So in that moment before I go under, I make sure to take that breath and acknowledge, acknowledge life. Because one of my favorite quotes from one of the Buddhist texts that I read, it's from the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying by Sogyal Rinpoche. I probably butchered his name, but the thought is there. The quote is that the time of your death is not the time to prepare for it. I captured the essence of that quote, but here's how it actually goes. I often think of the words of the great Buddhist master Padmasambhava. Those who believe they have plenty of time get ready only at the time of death. Then they are ravaged by regret. But isn't it far too late? I've confronted my death many times now. Even before the first surgery, I, I really thought about and confronted it many times. And, you know, we're all going to go sometime. To be able to confront it without fear on, you know, relatively my own terms. I know, you know, when I'm going into surgery, when I'm getting the anesthesia, I have time to think about it and really consider it as a possibility. Not avoid it, not dodge it, because you gain more from confronting that fear of death if you have it. And if you do have it, let me know. I'll talk to you. I'll make a video about it if you want. There's some good philosophers who talked about it and sort of the implications and what you can actually really even know about death. Why you shouldn't be afraid of it. I'll save that for another video though, because that's a another deep topic. And I probably, yeah, I have only a little bit more time. I'm going to pick my dad up from the airport soon. He's coming out to support me for the start of this round of radiation. See, told you I have a good team. You know, I'm 37. Still got the parents who love and support me and will come out for this kind of thing. I'm also an only child, so they are a little more invested. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but it is wonderful to see. So that's what spurred this surgery, was that loss of vision. I was in surgery immediately, and then home within two days. With uh, brain surgeries, it's not like an abdomen or something that you use a lot. like. Your skull isn't moving around. So once you're able to do, you know, the basic human things, walking, eating, drinking, pooping, they'll let you go home, go recover at home, which is much nicer. You know, as long as you're not sh showing signs of, you know, going back into seizure or anything like that, you know, any kind of danger signs, that they definitely want you to be comfortable and still reach out, get some good pain medication for the first little bit as your staples heal up. I won't show the gruesome images, but for the first surgery I had 55 staples in an L pattern on my head. I might show some, you know, after shots of what it looked like without the bloody staples on there. Uh, this one was, I believe, 25 staples, so a lot less, but still not fun. <laughs> they are not fun to get out, I'll tell you what. Just think about how you pull a staple out of paper and then, you know, it's not the same, it doesn't curl up around the skin, but it's still gotta come out. <laughs> it's still feels like a staple remover on your head. It's not great. So yeah, there are definitely some crappy times in these recoveries. You know, I can't highlight everything. There are a lot of difficulties. But there's also, you know, it just, it's steps of getting better. It's not always a straight line. That's one of the biggest things you realize, both in life and in these recoveries. These are just kind of microcosms of how we experience all of the difficulties of life just shoves it all into one quick package, densely packed. But man, it's uh, kind of like the boot camp I went to for coding. It's a crash course. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do, but man, is it rewarding. It gets you to a, another state of life, that's for sure. So I really encourage you, if you're going through something difficult like this, don't focus on the pain, the suffering. Focus on what you can learn from it, because that's what we do as humans. It's what we do as life. Life takes the pain and the suffering of the environment and uses it to grow. 
it's the shitty fact of the matter is sometimes the world and life gives somebody too much it's you can't it it kills them with the cancer you know it's it's not like what happened with me and i basically had a full recovery sometimes life just fucks you just straight up and it's for the people left around to learn and grow hopefully they were able to accept it and take it with kindness and grace but sometimes it's tough sometimes they didn't have a chance to learn how to do that so I feel for those people I do which is again <clears throat> excuse me Thanks for giving me a moment. A moment. I won't say sorry. <laughs> There's nothing to be sorry for, but that's why I'm making this for people like that, so that people don't have to go through it alone to not know that there's a better way to make it through. You don't have to suffer. Suffering can be a choice. What happens to us doesn't, isn't always, but suffering is our choice. So if I can help alleviate a little bit of that, that'll make me happy. Because that's the point of life, is to grow, to take that suffering that we're all bound to experience, because that's the world we live in. Life grows through suffering, so take that suffering and grow. Become the best you, share that, help others become the best version of themselves. Because to me, that's the meaning of life. to grow, become better, help others grow, help the world grow. We don't know to what we're going to grow toward in the future. We don't know what difficulties we'll face and what we'll need to become, what our ultimate goal is, but that's okay. We can let go of that and still know that we are becoming better versions of ourselves, of the world, of the systems we create. That's the whole point. That's what we've evolved doing. We became human by life improving through the different pain and stimulus in the environment till we became humans who can do so much to control our environment. And yet we're still also subject to so much of it. So much of the whims of fate of the world. But we continue like life before us. Learning, 
growing. You know what? I think that's a good place to leave this for now. Because we don't always clean everything in one go. And that's okay. Plus, I'm tearing up a little more still. So I'm going to leave it here for today. And I'm going to leave that in. Because one thing that happens after these surgeries is that my heart opens up a little more. I'm more able to feel empathy, the suffering of others, and the beauty of life as well in all that. So I'll let you see that. That's okay. I hope that you all got something from this. Please let me know in the comments if it helped, if there, what more you want to know about the surgeries, the recovery, the things that I mentioned about, you know, philosophy. There's plenty more to go on. Part of the reason I had trouble doing this is because there is just so much. But I covered what I can. There's a little all over the place, but you kind of know a little bit about what I've been through, what I'm going through, and who I am. So I hope it helped. And if you liked, please like it. It'll help me make more. And if you want, subscribe. I'm going to make more of this. I'm going to have another channel kind of dedicated to this. And for now, I'll just keep doing it on this channel. There may still be other kind of videos, gameplay videos, but I don't know. We'll see. This is my channel. I'm going to do what I want. I hope you enjoy it too. For now, oh, see ya.